and give him praise this morning, EKM Toronto Church. Yes, it sounds good in here. It sounds good in here. It sounds a little litty in here. It sounds a little litty in here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One of the songs we sang, um, I believe the line said, I got a history. Is that how it? Yes. Anybody have a history? Yeah, like the, the I came in and, and, and I felt a little, you know, I'm just tired. But when I saw that line, I started to remember. Anybody else have that experience in the house of the Lord? You start to remember from where you came and the goodness of the Lord. And I said, no, 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 no. I didn't drive all the way to EKM to let a rock cry out for me. So come on and give him some praise this morning. Yes, praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Listen, I want to say good morning to everyone. Good morning, of course, to our e-church that is joining us online. My name is Pastor Nicole, and I'm one of the uh, associate pastors here that gets the divine and blessed and exciting opportunity to serve our, our lead pastors, Pastor Colvin and Pastor Monique Chambers. Would you go ahead and celebrate the leadership, our pastoral leadership in the house today? I want to encourage you, like it's so easy to come in and just get focused on what's happening in the front, but you've got some uh, some destiny helpers and some kingdom connections sitting in your row. So why don't you just turn to them and just find a few people and just greet them, say hello. I see some people in EKM shirts. Let them know you look good today. The favor of the Lord looks good on you. The blessings of the Lord looks good on you. And while we're doing that in house, here's what you can do online in the broadcast why don't you share this morning's broadcast with at least two of your friends and your loved ones go ahead and like and share and if you haven't already done so we encourage you to subscribe this morning and be our e-evangelist <laughs> all right everyone feeling greeted and acknowledged yes doesn't the room feel warmer already oh yes there's something beautiful about community all right, so there's a few uh, things that I need to share with you this morning. Um, we have a couple of, now of announcements. So, of course, we know that our Wednesday breakaway. Um, how many people just see have been, it's been a blessing to you? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I know it's the thing that I look forward to. I actually set it in my calendar um, so that whatever I'm doing, I'm like, oh, yes, it's break win. This is just a time if you don't know what it is. Um, it's we, we really just treat it almost like a podcast style. It's led by Pastor C, and he just shares the, the rhema word for us. You know, sometimes we leave from Sunday, then Monday hits you, <laughs> then Tuesday hits you. Um, but we're so glad when Wednesday comes because we get to plug back in as a community. We get to hear the word of the Lord. We get to pray um, and even if you're at work your video doesn't have to be on we meet over zoom you can just plug in and join and hear the word of the Lord as uh, God is speaking to uh, Pastor Colvin to the church all right what else do we got here so we've got breakaway and so that's 12 p.m. that's 12 p.m. Um, let me hear all of the women who have been eating their bellies full at the word cafe with Pastor Monique so we started a few months back. This is led by Pastor Monique, and this is a time where the women have been gathering um, on the second uh, Saturday of each month, I believe, and she's been taking us through the book of Nehemiah. If you haven't been joining, don't worry. This Wednesday um, at uh, 7 p.m., this Wednesday, August 2nd, 7 p.m., Pastor Mo will be going uh, live, and she'll be talking about um, Chapter 5. So this will be a nice way for you to just catch right up, because the following Saturday on the on August 12th at 9.30 a.m. on Zoom, we'll be meeting again and picking back up, and she'll be going over Chapter 6 and 7. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful time, isn't it, ladies? And we're, we're not just going to reading the Word, but we're just understanding how it meets our life practically and how we can rebuild and just really just walk out. I see heads nodding, how we can walk out the word of God in our lives. And so this is a great opportunity for you to get connected at the community, um, as a community here. Um, we are uh, a few weeks away from kicking off our anniversary here at EKM. Yes. 
It's only been, can you believe that it's only been two years? It's only been two years, and we are so blessed. And so we're doing that with a bowling night. Um, let me hear all the competitors in the house. I know we have some competitors that are looking forward to that. So this is a free night. We're kicking that off um, on, uh, let me get the date here for you. That's happening on uh, August, the weekend of August 12th at 3 p.m. at Bolorama. So that's actually just up the road from here. We do ask that you register. So we need you to go to the website and register. It's a free event, but you do need to cover the cost of the shoes. We have reserved about 70, seven to eight lanes, um, but we just need you to register. You'll cover the cost of the shoes. For kids 12 and under, the cost is only $3. And for those that are 13 and up, it's $4.50. So so don't forget again to go ahead to our website and register. Um, we are a teaching house here at EKM. Aren't you excited about that? Yeah, like listen, like we don't just come and holler. Like I love the hollering. I'm a Pentecostal evangelical baby. I like to holler. I like to do laps. I like to do all of that. But listen, we are a teaching house and we are so grateful for that. And um, so our Christianity 101 is coming back and that's going to be led by Pastor C. And that is happening online on Zoom on August 16th at 7 p.m on zoom and so he'll be covering salvation and grace he'll also be touching on holy spirit and also talking about the spirit our spiritual gifts so if you ever wanted to just kind of really delve um, biblically theologically and unpack the scripture and understand um, your salvation to be able to defend the faith that you're a part of you want to be on Christian Christianity 101 if you are already a the theologian you want to be on Christianity 101 because we want to make sure that we are just keeping our tools sharp. Amen? Yeah, keeping our tools sharp. So again, that's happening on August uh, the 16th at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Um, it's a busy month for the ladies this month. I talked about our bellies being full with the word, but we're actually going to fill our bellies um, with some, some natural food as well because there's a ladies barbecue being, yes, ladies, it's long overdue long overdue and so pastor mo will be leading that for us on august 19th it's a it's a women's meetup the last one we had was at boston pizza and we were just like guys we just we got to do more of this so the more of this is here august 19th um and so make sure you check out the details on the website we'll be bringing more information for you as we get closer to that date listen i know there's a lot of things happening in house so if you've missed anything make sure you sign up for our newsletter we send those out weekly to, so you can know what's going on and keep you abreast of what's going on in the house listen ekm toronto it is giving time. Yes. It is such a it's such a great privilege and blessing and honor the posture of giving. Um, it's also an act of worship. It's not a time in the service where we pause to ask for money for the house. No, this is also a part of our worship unto God. And so 2 Corinthians chapter 9 um, and verses 11 to 12, it says this. It says, you, someone say me. It says, you will be enriched in every way. So you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform, someone say service. Yes, giving is a beautiful act of service. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it is also overflowing overflowing in many ways of expression to God. And we see that in the house. We've had the opportunity um, to just be such a blessing to this community. Oh, um, we've had this space filled with children from, from some of the highest priority neighborhoods just around our church um, to give them experiences that their parents may not be, a, be able to afford. Um, we've gone in and be able to feed seniors who are shut in and, and fearful of going into the community um, because they are vulnerable we went right to them and listen we, we've gone and can you backpacks for kids your generosity 
Your service is enabling, as Pastor C always says, you're not giving to the church, but you're giving through the church. And I can tell you that this is a house that stewards your resources well. And so this is an opportunity for us to give. There are uh, several ways for you to give. You can give in-house if you're in the building at the, at the front here. You can do an email transfer, giving at ecamtoronto.com. All the ways to give are online. And of course, we have our debit machine out in the foyer for you as well. And let's just, can I just bless our giving before we, before we give? I always like to name, I like to treat my giving as a seed and I like to give it a name because I understand biblically the power of seed time and harvest. Because if you just give and forget about it, we're not really looking with expectancy. But when I think of my giving as a seed in accordance to scripture, I know that when I put a seed in the ground, it may not be today, it may not be three weeks from now, Depending on how you've named the seed, it may even take a month. But Father God, this morning I pray for every seed that is going into the ground. That God, with great expectation, we look for a bountiful reward. God, you said that you would rebuke the devourer on our, half, our behalf. And that there's a blessing for those who give, God. This morning I pray, God, for those that need a blessing of healing. I pray for God for those who need a blessing of restoration. I pray God for those who just need you to make a way out of no way for them today. That God as their seed goes into the ground. That you would allow a twofold, threefold, tenfold blessing to return to them. And not only just to our pockets, but God we will remember to come back and to thank you and to give you praise. And to ensure that those fruit feed your house and feed your community. Bless this house, I pray God, as we give in Jesus' name. God is good. All the time. Oh yeah, and all the time. God is good. Amen. I wasn't sure if I was gonna get the response I was looking for. Let's do it again. God is good. the Lord. We say he is good all the time, all the time. So not just on our good days, not just when he's done something for you, you know, not just when you drop two pounds on the scale that morning. He is good. He is good all the time. And that goodness is never ending. It's never failing. So you can rest assured that regardless of how you're feeling, how far you may have strayed, that goodness is always there for you to go back. It's always there for you to rest on. Do I have a church that understands that, that agrees with that? Amen. So let's say it one more time. God is good. And all the time. God is good. And all the time. Let's put our hands together. This song says, It's not my worship that makes you worthy. God, you are always good. With or without my song, you're still holy. God, you are always good. And I can't help, hallelujah. I've got to let it out. You never needed my voice to cry holy. Still, so I get to say you're good. With my whole heart, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah.
God church come on if you got the energy for it this morning praise God if you woke up this morning and you came all the way out here from wherever you came praise God 
Come on, somebody just give God a shout right now and say hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's worthy of all our attention. He's worthy of all our praise. He's glorious. He's holy. He's excellent. He's beyond anything we could imagine. But he comes down to our level so that we can get close to him. So he's worthy of our praise. Amen. 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 Praise God. Bless you, church. God bless you. God bless you, worshipers. God bless you, musicians. God bless you, everybody who's serving in the house today. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Um, before we go any further, we got a video right here that we want you to see real quick. So avert your eyes from me and have a look at the screen. And that's going to be great. All right. Hello, 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 everyone. I hope you are enjoying the service so far. For those who don't know me, my name is Calvin Chambers, and I am the lead pastor of this incredible ministry, a ministry that I'm extremely proud of called, of course, EKM Toronto Church. If you are new to EKM, please go to ekmtoronto.com. All of our information is on there. And don't forget to sign up to our newsletter so you can be up to date with all the incredible things that God is doing in this ministry. Now, if you haven't put it together, my wife and I are not in the building. No, we are taking a pause. But Pastor Kadeem is going to be delivering the word this morning. I'm excited because we are starting our new series called Transferable Skills. Yes, Transferable Skills. Listen, if you apply this series to your life, God is going to do some incredible things in your life. Love you much, EKM. God. All right, it's good to be here with you guys this morning. If you don't already know, my name is Kadeem. I'm, uh, what am I? What do I do here? I'm one of the associate pastors at EKM. And by God's grace, I get to serve with Pastor Colvin and Pastor Monique Changer, Ch Chambers under their leadership, uh, along with Pastor Nicole. I'm going to get it together. Just give me a few minutes. All right. Once I get into my, my thing, you know what I mean? I'm going to get there. Um, so yes, we're talking about transferable skills today. Um, I want you to turn with me in your Bible so that we can get into the first uh, message of our new transferable skills um, series. And you're going to turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. We're just going to read verse 1 for now. We might get into some more, but Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. And it reads, now, we, we got different translations here. I'm reading from um, um, Christian Standard Bible. Uh, my translation reads, now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. Once again, now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen seen. Father, in the mighty and precious name of Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for allowing us to see another day. Thank you for affording us another opportunity to come in your presence, to acknowledge you for who you are. Yes, you're a holy God. You're high and you're lofty. You're the creator of the universe and you're far away and outside of all things, but you're also deeply and intimately involved in all things, permeating all things. Your very word permeates this universe and by your word nothing in this universe has come to be that has indeed come to be so we thank you we bless you Lord God in the mighty and precious name of Jesus thank you for whatever it is that you have that you want to communicate to us today Lord God I don't consider myself worthy to speak your word but by your grace I'm here so I pray that whatever needs to be communicated not only will it be communicated but it will be understood and we able to, we'll be able to act on what you've got for us in Jesus name. Amen. God bless you guys. You can have a seat. So transferable skills, transferable skills. That's what we're talking about. And the first message up is going to be about faith, right? Usually when we're talking about transferable skills, we're talking about communications. We're talking about being able to manage and steward finances. We're talking about all sorts of tangible things that you can teach in this world, but we disclude some things um, that could be considered uh, spiritual, right? And so we're not going to do that today. We're going to talk about something highly and uniquely spiritual, but we're going to 
approach it from the perspective of, of, of what it is and what it means to us as Christians. That's why we're going to talk about faith. Amen? So this word faith, we're reading it in Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, we're reading verse 1, um, and it says, Faith is the reality of things that we have hoped for. That word faith in Greek is pistis. Pistis, and it comes from a root word, um, pytho. And pytho literally means I persuade, right? So the context of the word, uh, of the word pistis, the word that we use for faith, is to have been persuaded uh, concerning some truth, some reality, um, and, and you're persuaded in such a way where you've placed all your reliance and all your adherence and all your essential belief in whatever this truth is, right? So whatever you find to be true, you now find yourself in a situation where you place your faith, your adherence, your reliance, your belief on this truth. And you do that believing in things in a spiritual way. So you believe in things in a spiritual way. What does that mean? It means you believe in things that can't be seen. Because spiritual things can't be seen. So whatever truth you've been approached by, whatever truth you're convicted by, you believe in it with, with, with such a depth that even though you can't see it, it's a reality to you. Amen? It's a reality to you. And you do that in spite of material obstacles. What would be the most obvious material obstacle in believing in something that you can't see? The invisible nature of the thing that you can't see, right? So you can't see something, but you know it's real, right? And there are some things that are closer to home and more instantaneous that we have no choice but to believe in, right? So gravity, for example. You can't see gravity, but you can see its effects, like, instantly. If I were to, which I'm not going to do, but if I were to, you would understand that that's going to drop, right? Now, breaking down this verse before I move forward, because I don't want to take too much of your time today. It says, now faith is a reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. For something to acquire your belief, despite its invisible nature, there has to be something that was communicated to you about it that you can't let go of. No matter what you do, no matter what you try. If somebody were to tell you something that would make you feel a certain way, it would still be difficult to let go of what you already perceive to be true. If somebody were to tell you, I've got a room where the rules of reality, they, 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 or the rules of gravity, excuse me, don't necessarily apply, you wouldn't be able to take that at face value. You'd have to find your way in that room first. And you wouldn't care what anybody said to you. Does that make sense? You wouldn't care what people say or what they think about, I've got a room where gravity doesn't apply. What doesn't apply. You've got to go there and you've got to know it for yourself. Otherwise, no matter how good you feel about that person, no matter what kind of rep relationship or rapport you have with that person, no matter how they communicate to you and how they talk to you, no matter what kind of relationship you have, it doesn't matter how much you trust them, you're not necessarily just going to be able to believe what they say without having experienced it yourself. Right? But because, let's say you do know them, and let's say you do have a good relationship, let's say you do kind of trust them, you're inclined to feel like they're telling you the truth. I'm going somewhere. You're inclined to feel like they're telling you the truth. For example, I recently, I hope this thing's fully charged. Hold on a second. So I recently got, the, it just looks like beads, right? So I recently got these beads from a relative of mine, and basically what they do, okay, yeah, it's charged. So basically what they do is if I were to, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how to use it, but that's fine, I got it. So if I were to let it go right now, um, it's not just gonna drop to the ground because it has some, one of these things is like, I don't, I don't know science, I can't explain anything. But it's not going to drop to the ground because the, the, the beads are kind of ceramic, and if they drop too fast, they're going to break. So they make these newfangled beads that um, when you, like, if I happen to drop it from this distance, it will fall slower. 
before it just suddenly falls to the ground, right? Okay, all right. You guys have known me for a long time, most of you. We've all been going to this church for a while. Some of you know my name. How many of you believe me? <laughs> okay, good. And even if you want to believe me, and even if you feel like you should believe me, that's ridiculous, right? You've never heard of anything like that. It's because I'm, I'm not lying. We don't lie in church. But I'm definitely not telling you the truth. There's no such technology and any such bees that I know of that's been made by anybody. But because you know me, some of you, and some of you trust me, especially that pretty one right there in the front, you kind of feel like you're inclined to believe what I'm saying, and you want to trust what you feel. You want to trust your feelings that say, this person wouldn't deceive me, this person wouldn't lie to me, this person wouldn't. What I'm trying to explain to you today, in just this one moment, is that we don't need to trust in those feelings. We need to trust in what we know. All right? Flashback. What's Pastor C been talking to us about the last two weeks? Amygdala. All right? So, construction of the brain, what happens at the front, cerebral cortex, what happens in the back, by the, down here, the spinal cord, the base, uh, the cerebellum, and what happens in the middle? What do you have in the middle? The amygdala. And the amygdala is responsible for feelings, fight or flight, all that kind of stuff. And it sends signals to the cerebellum, which is responsible for a lot of the movement. Uh, but the cerebral cortex contains all the intellect and the knowledge and the information that you need to make discernible, well-assessed, and well-defined decisions. So if we have to look at things from that perspective, what we first and what we immediately understand is that faith it's not about what you feel. If you respond to what you feel, because what Pastor C has been saying to us is that we respond too much to how we feel and we don't assess what we know. Faith is not about what you feel. Faith is about what you know. Faith is not about what things seem to look like. Faith is about what knowledge you have and what you've been told by somebody who you know is reliable. But that person only tells you facts. And so even when everybody else is thinking that you're crazy, you know that that person... He, he's, he can't lie to you. He's not rocking up to your church on Sunday morning talking about no magic beads, right? He's somebody who tells you absolute truth. Even when that absolute truth seems crazy. Take, for example, Noah. He was told that there was an absolute truth on the way, so he needs to build something bigger than anything that's ever been built because rain is coming, and you need to be able to escape that rain so that I can keep you and your family alive. And so he starts building a boat. Mind you, the drought that Noah was experiencing in his days was so severe that the scripture says, in those days it had not rained on the earth. For generations, people hadn't seen rain. And now this guy's building a boat, not because there's a flood coming inland, but because rain is going to come down so intensely that we're going to need to be able to float on top of it. So, just from a social perspective, if you're, excuse me, this guy looks crazy, right? This guy looks insane. It looks like he, but Noah doesn't care because he's not worried about what you and I think, and he's not worried about his contempt, what his contemporaries think. He's not worried about his neighbors. He's worried about what the one that he knows is telling him, and he knows it to be true because of what? His faith. His faith tells him that what God is about to do is indeed about to happen. You even have Abraham. God keeps telling Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. Abraham's far too old to have kids, and he hasn't had any kids. But he believes in God so much that he lives and abides by the promise that God has given him. And when the son of promise arrives, Abraham's faith is proven. It's true and it's justified. But there's a deeper level to faith. And this is something that we often struggle with. I don't want to touch too much on this, but I, I, I need us to think about it. Because we're living in a society where we have people who we sometimes think aren't willing to work just because they're lazy or they're not willing to work because they don't see the point. But what's actually happening is we're living in a society with people who aren't willing to put their hands to work that they're not going to be able to benefit from. That's the kind of world that we're living in. Because everything that we want, we want it now, right? We, we, everything is about convenience. Everything is about how fast this how much that we're living in a world where nobody's willing to do anything or put their hands to any level of work that they're not going to ultimately see the benefit of. 
Now, if you search the scriptures, they're always talking about generations and generations. You'll have people who are willing, who are willing to do work that they know they're not going to see finished, but they know if they don't start putting their hands to it now, the future generations are never going to benefit. So, even when it comes to Abraham, God is prom promising him, you'll be a great nation. Abraham knows that even if he has one kid or ten kids or a hundred kids, he's never going to live to see those people become a nation. But even though that feeling of, why should I carry this out? Why should I do this? Why should I, why should I honor God? His faith in God is far too real for that. His faith in God allows him to move and to live and to act and to do in such a way where he's able to rely on God and trust in God. And the things that God promises him and the things that God shows him all throughout his life enable him to know that God's promise is going to come to pass. All right? I'm just laying some groundwork here, and then I'm going to get to what I actually want to talk to you guys about. All right? So these people, they've received faith, and now because they've received faith, they've, they've, they've taken their reliance and all their trust and all their adherence, and they've placed it in God. Everything that they believe is bound up in God. But the question is this. How do they receive the faith? Romans chapter 4, verse 3. If we can put that on the screen. Romans chapter 4, verse 3. For what does the scriptures, for what do the scriptures say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. He believed God. What, what, what do you have to do to believe in something? There has to be some sort of experience. There has to be some sort of exchange in perceived realities. I'm here, and that's fine, but I need to believe in something. And how can I believe in something if I don't see it or, or, or hear from it? And so in Abraham's case, he was told the word of God and he believed God. Right? So it's just that simple. What we hear from God is worthy of us believing. And when we do indeed believe in God, we get to live a different life. The Bible says that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So what must we do to believe or have faith? We have to hear. And what does the Bible say in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, if we can put that on the screen. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. The Bible says, so faith comes from what is heard. And what is heard comes from God. And in another translation, it says, through the message about Christ. Faith comes from what we hear. In our Christian context, we receive faith from what we hear. For example, there's something that we all believe, and that's the reason why we're here, that binds us and that unites us and draws us close to God. And how do we come into believing that? We heard it. There was a message that was told to us. We were told that 2,000 years ago, there was a man who came into the world of a miraculous birth, lived a sinless life, died an atoning death, and a sacrifice was carried out through that death that he died. Now, as proof that God accepted the sacrifice, God allowed that man to raise himself from the dead. That man is Jesus of Nazareth. Amen? We're here in church because we heard that and we believe that. And because we heard that and we believe that, our lives are being lived differently than they would have been lived if we never believed or if we never heard. Case in point, we're here. It's 12 o'clock. We could have just woken up. It's Sunday. If we don't believe that, why are we wasting our time here? Amen? Like, if you don't believe... No, I don't want to... If you don't believe that, why are you wasting your time here? I want to encourage you to believe that, to understand that that's real. The gospel is true. 
and it's the only thing that brings us salvation. Amen? But you only believe it because you heard it. You only heard it because somebody was able to tell it to you, and someone was only able to tell it to you because they believed it, and they only believe it because they heard it. Your faith gets wrapped up in this God who, because of this gospel, apparently we're able to live after the example of Christ. Our sins are not counted against us anymore. The same way that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, the way that we place our faith in Christ, our faith is now counted to us as righteousness. And the wrongs that we did in the past and the wrongs that we're doing on a daily basis and the wrongs that we're doing right now, even as we sit here and we, we talk about this, 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 this thing of faith, and the wrongs that we're going to do tomorrow, they don't get counted against us. But instead, God has a plan for our salvation. Amen? So if it's true that we receive faith by hearing, we've already heard the gospel message, but your faith is something that it has to be strengthened. So what else do you need to hear? When they talk about faith being something that you hear, oftentimes what would happen is um, when these people were going to church or when they were going to synagogue, uh, people didn't really have physical copies of, of scriptures, but they had to listen to what was told to them. So they had to go to the synagogue, and they had yearly schedules on which scripture would be written. Um, sorry, on which scripture would be read, right? And for these many weeks, you would cover this book, and for these many weeks, you would cover that book, and you would go through the, the entire system until you get through scripture. And people would go, and they would sit in synagogue on a daily basis, and they would hear the word of God. Now, what they hear in the synagogue, because they've already placed their faith in the message of who God is, it would take away what they're hearing from the outside world. It would replace that stuff. They could move on in a new frame of thinking without having to be bothered by the things in the world. Because what they're hearing about God is strengthening their faith. Amen? How are you guys doing? All right, cool. We're there now, okay? I'm going to get to my point. Right? All that stuff is nice. Praise God. But we're talking about transferable skills. So the question becomes this. We know now how faith works. You hear about God. You believe in him because of what you've heard. And you live a different life than you would have lived if you had never heard. Right? Does that make sense? We have examples about it from Scripture. We have examples about it from our daily living. And we understand now that faith is something that transforms you once you hear it and if you respond to it. Right? But so now how does it become a transferable skill? How does it work? How does it work that this is something that you can use in different dimensions, in different streams of existence. The most important point to me is this, that faith in Christ makes us righteous. Going back to Romans chapter 4, verse 3. Faith in Christ makes us righteous. Why is that important? When we examine the religions of the world, when we examine everything in this world around us, when we examine systems of merit, everything tells you that if you do good, you'll receive good. And everything tells you that if you look at it from the world's cosmic perspective, if you're a good person when you're alive, when you die, you'll have a good afterlife. But the Bible says that the righteousness of men is like filthy rags before God. So how good is good enough? Like what, what level of good do you have to do that's going to imagine just a blank white sheet of paper and then you take ink and you put a dot on there and then you keep drawing all over the paper and then you decide this is no good and so you start erasing it but it's ink so you're covering it up you know those um those white out pens you're covering up with that you can still see that something happened here that wasn't supposed to happen 
It's the same way with us trying to do good deeds to cover up our sin nature. It doesn't work. The nature of sin is that we're born with it. The nature of sin is that uh, the Bible says that from the womb we were speaking lies. It's something that we inherit at conception. So there's nothing that we can do on our own accord to make ourselves right with God. What do I mean by that? I mean that like we're doomed and we have no hope. We can't get right with God. We're all worthy of his judgment. We're all worthy of his condemnation. So we have to look towards something else. There has to be something else that can save us. If only there was a man who didn't come into the world conceived in sin, and if only that man lived a life completely and perfectly without sin, and if only that man allowed his blood to be shed for the remission of sins, because the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Sins can't be put away unless something dies, because sin brings death. In order to balance that out and make it neutral again, there has to be more death. But if what dies is also sinful, it's a temporary stay of God's wrath. So something or someone without sin has to die so that we can overcome the problem. And thank God for Jesus Christ. He dies. The problem is overcome. Amen? But so now we don't need to do that. All we need to do is believe in Jesus. We don't need to also die. We don't need to follow his, his example in death. We need to follow his example in living. So if we follow him and we do things the way that he would have done them, how do we know how to do that, by the way? By hearing about scripture, placing our faith in what scripture says. If we do things the way that he would have done them if he was physically here, we're now, we're now only living the way that we should have been living in the first place. So we're not doing anything special for God. God's not gaining anything special for us. What's happening is God's doing something special for us. He's saving us even though we don't deserve it. He's preserving us from destruction, from his wrath. I, 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 for those of you who don't know, I also um, I work with a, a, a youth church um, not too far away from here. And I ask them, you know, what are, what, are we, what are we being saved from? Because the whole nature of Christianity is that we need salvation. What are we being, what are we being saved from? Hell, the consequences of our sins. I said, think more simple. Boil it down. What are we being saved from? Uh, fire, eternal punishment. Okay, okay, okay. But where's that all coming from? Oh, I don't know. From God. We're being saved from his wrath that has to be poured out on unrighteousness. Uh, Romans chapter 1. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven and is poured out on all unrighteousness of men. He has to punish sin, otherwise he's not just. But he has to show grace, otherwise he's not merciful. So that's what this whole thing is about. You send Jesus into the world, you give people the opportunity to know and encounter Jesus, they accept him or they reject him. That's it. That's the whole thing, right? And so what happens when you, when you embrace that faith and you start understanding my actions and my deeds, they're not what's saving me, but it's faith in Christ that saves me. You become righteous, not because of your works, not because of your deeds, but because of a declaration from God. So whereas your faith was teaching you things, now your faith is doing things for you. Your faith was explaining to you that there's somebody who's worthy of your attention. There's somebody who's worthy to be believed in. But now your faith is also taking you away from what punishment was waiting for you. And it's bringing, to you, bringing you to the presence of God. It's bringing you to a holy preservation away from the wrath of God that you should have suffered. But God has decided, no, this person accepts and embla embraces and places their adherence and their reliance and their trust in the sacrifice of my sinless son so they won't get that punishment. It's that simple. Amen? What else though? Because that's awesome. But we still got to keep living this life. That's amazing. That's wonderful. It's the greatest miracle of all things. But we still have to continue living this life. Because when we place our faith in Jesus, Jesus commands us to follow him. He doesn't ask and he doesn't have a dialogue about it he commands us to follow him but then he also tells us how difficult it is to, to, to follow him he explains to his disciples that anybody who doesn't 
hate their mother and their father and their brother and sister and their children and even their very own life, they can't be my disciple. A disciple means a follower, a student of a master. So if all those things are more important to you than Jesus, you, you, can't, you can't even follow him. That's rough, right? But the game is the game, right? If everything in your life is more important to you than what God has done to preserve you from destruction and the man through whom God has done that, you won't be able to follow him, right? And I know it's difficult, but it's doable. How do we know it's doable? Because we know that people who have come before us and have placed their faith in Christ, they've done it. How do we know that? Because we're the testimony of their work. We're here right now because there were Apostle Pauls. We're here right now because there were Peters. We're here right now because there were reformers who brought the Protestant Reformation and brought us away from a system of rigidity and rules. And we're here right now because people who were compelled to follow Christ at the expense of everything else in their life laid their lives down so that a foundation could be made so that we could continue to follow Christ. Amen? And so, if faith becomes useful in our lives, and if we want faith to bring us to where God wants to get us, our, our, our next most reasonable step is to follow Christ. It's a command from God, but in following him, what ends up happening is we become like him. When you walk where somebody walks, and they start walking in dangerous places that they've already been before, you don't try and find your own way. You try and walk in their exact footsteps so that you don't fall into a pit, so that you don't step on a rock, so that nothing eats you, so that you don't fall off a cliff. You follow them exactly. You follow them their way. And it could be difficult because you've never done it before. So the guy who's walking in front of you, he's probably not going to have any blood on his feet because he already had blood on his feet from the first time he did it. When you do it, you might come out with some blood on your feet, but you're going to come out. You're going to make it. If you follow his example, you're going to become transformed. And the righteousness that gets imputed onto you, because God allows you to be righteous, because you've placed your faith in Christ, now you're going to systematically change and you're going to actually become righteous the way that God wants you to be. Amen? And finally, how does your faith become a transferable skill for the world in which you're living? Because all of this has to do with you and God. Everything that I've said so far, it has to do with you and God. It has to do with what God does for you. And that's excellent. It's glorious and it's holy. But if we have to follow Jesus, that means we have to follow his example. And in his example, he didn't just come and do things so that his relationship with God would be strengthened. His relationship with God couldn't be strengthened. There was no potential for it. He had the strongest relationship with God that anybody's ever going to have. But we also wanted to have strong relationships with God, so we followed his example. When Jesus came into the world, he came into the world not so that he could get closer to God, but so that he could bring others closer to God. When you place your faith in Christ, when you respond to faith, when you begin to adhere to God, to rely on him, to trust in him, when you do this, the transformation that takes place in you will begin to affect the world around you. It will affect your friends. It will affect your family. It will, reflect, it will affect the people that you know and love. It will affect your very community, your very society. When we're up here talking about giving time, you already know it's not going into the pastor's pockets. You know it's going into the community that we're in. You know it's going into things that are going to keep this going so that we can keep changing and impacting the world around us. And when you place your faith in God in such a way where you let go of the things that are important to you, in such a way where you, 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 you're willing to forsake those things that are supposed to be the most precious to you, all for the sake of following after the God who's given you everything that he had, when you place your faith in him and he transforms you, the world around you can't help but also be transformed. What we're talking about is, is, is planting a seed in the ground and then that tree growing up and it doing nothing for the environment around it. That's impossible, right? If a tree grows 
and it's strong and it has branches and it has leaves, it casts shade, it bears fruit, it protects animals, it feeds animals, it shelters animals. It's impossible for a seed to be planted into the ground and something to grow from it and for that seed not to be able to do anything. But it starts with the seed. My encouragement to you today is to place your faith in God and to strengthen yourself in that faith. How do you strengthen yourself in that faith? Know God. How do you know God? Through his word. How do you relate to God? Through communication with him. We, we don't do this stuff because it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting religious exercise that it just fills our lives until our days are expended. We do this because we get to know our creator. And when we continue out of this life, we get to be in the presence of our creator. But it starts in this life. Again, my encouragement is to place your faith in God and know him. Search him. Do everything that you can to find him. Amen? Let's stand. Before I close, Romans chapter 12, verse 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 12 reads, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, and what is the good and pleasing and perfect will of God. As you know him, and as you learn about him, and as you live with him, and as you walk with him, you're going to learn and know and understand how to do things the way that he wants them done. And that's going to be a transformative blessing to you and your relationship with him, and it's going to be a transformative blessing to everyone around you, to your family, to, your, to the things that you have to forsake, so that you can follow him, it's going to be a blessing. Amen? Praise God. Father, in the mighty and precious name of Jesus, thank you for allowing us, for enabling us to trust in what we can't see. We know that when we hear the message of the gospel, it's so absurd that we shouldn't be able to believe it. But by your grace, because of some spark that you place inside of us, we do believe it. That same faith that you used and placed inside of Noah so that he could preserve humanity, that same faith that you used and placed inside of Abraham so that he could have a child who could have a child whose children could become a nation through which nation the savior of the world would come into this world, that same faith, Lord God, we're asking not only that we would place it in our hearts, but that we would live by it and abide by it, that we would place our trust, our adherence, and our reliance in you, Lord God. I pray that everybody who is here today under the sound of my voice would understand the importance of searching you out. You've given us resources, Lord God, so that we can know you. You've given us the revelation of this world that we can see, but you've given us special revelation in your word that we can hold. I pray, Lord God, that we would be strengthened in our faith by how we search you out, by how we seek you, and by how we find you. Be blessed and be glorified, O oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. Your goodness has never depended